everyone, and welcome back to another special episode of Kerbal Space Program in the Elegant Design Bureau. And this time, in response to one of the comments on the Saturn V video, I have created, well, I think you can tell what I've created from down here from the title of the video. It's an N1. It's the N1 L3. And you can see this is Mark III, which means I haven't done quite as much testing as I have with the Saturn V. And so this is still prototype phase. I haven't brought it to orbit yet. I have reasonable assurance that I can get into orbit. Uh, I've gotten it past the first stage, but uh, I haven't gotten it to orbit yet. So we're probably not going to go for the moon this time unless I'm very, very lucky. But we will get the N1 farther than... Uh, then they actually got the N1. The N1 was the Russian rocket meant to go to the moon. And uh, the, the first response people have is, wow, they were so stupid, they put 30 engines at the bottom. Um, so let me clear up some of the misconceptions about that. They were not being stupid by putting the 30 engines at the bottom. Uh, Sergei Korolev, the designer of the N1, was also the designer of the Soyuz. And and he was not prone to be stupid when it comes to rocket design. Uh, the problem, he had many, many problems to deal with. The first problem he had was that the main Russian rocket designer, uh, Valentin Glushko, was a personal enemy of his. And Glushko, Glushko had actually sent him to the Gulag uh, many years ago. Uh, he had uh, uh, testified against him. So, so they, there was no love lost between these two men, and Glushko insisted on building rockets with a UDMH N204 fuel mixture, which was hypergolic, but inefficient. The reason he liked that mixture is because, being hypergolic, it could be stored as ICBMs. Um, so ICBMs sit around for, you know, decades not being used, so you want fuels that will ignite on contact. Uh, Sergei Korolev, of course, wanted more efficient rockets, and so, and Glushko just wouldn't budge because they were personal enemies and that's just how it was. So Korolev had to find somebody else to design the rockets. The only person really available was the jet engine designer, uh, Nikolai Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov didn't have much experience building rockets. And so uh, the best he could do was these. These are not, these, these are powerful rockets, but they're not uh, sufficiently powerful to get you to the moon. And so, and they weren't particularly safe either. Uh, there was a lot of worry about their uh, reliability, especially when clustered like this, because of the f way the fuel has to be fed to all of these things. So, Korolev had to put more than what was strictly necessary on the bottom stage in order to ensure that his rocket would get off the ground. This is way overpowered. This is designed so that a lot of these engines can fail. And that's purely because, of course, Kuznetsov and uh, Korolev hadn't worked out all the kinks into, in the system, and Kuznetsov wasn't really the rocket designer in the first place. Uh, he's a great jet designer. So, so you can see here, uh, if I can move this into the field of view, uh, uh, get, get, go, go, go. All right, uh, sea level thrust to weight ratio of six points, uh, 1.61 which is way more than is necessary for this rocket. This rocket uh, should only need 1.2 at most. But, uh, but yeah, that's because they were expecting a lot of these engines to fail and then have to shut down the engines in pairs. Okay, and of course there was funding issues, there were all sorts of other issues, but the main issue that led to this odd design of having 30 rockets at the bottom was because of the personal relationship between Korolev and Glushkov. So, all right. Now I've no, I've named them Mark III instead of using block uh, block A, block B, block C because the N1 rocket has blocks. Uh, it, uh, the stages are named blocks. So the first stage is called block A. The second stage is called block B. The third stage is called block V. I suppose for vacuum. The Fourth stage is called block G, and then the fifth stage, yes, there's five stages, and that's not including the lander's own stage. The fifth stage is called block D, okay? And then we have the two rockets for the, 
for the command module, if you will, the Soyuz. It's actually a Soyuz. And then the lander. So lots of rockets involved in this. This is not built precisely to... Sp it, the fuel burn times is correct. The rockets are correct. Um, actually, uh, the original rockets for the N1 would have been NK-15s on the base and then NK-15Vs on the second stage. Uh, but I only have NK-33s. These are the upgraded versions. Uh, they, they had them during the lifetime of the NK-1. So while the NK-1 was being developed, they had uh, changed the NK-15s to NK-33s uh, and the NK-15Vs to NK-43s. So they would have had these available by the early 70s. So that, that would have been possible. So this is not too far off. And uh, they had a... Actually, I should name this in one like this, right? Anyway, um, minor issue. But... Okay, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, anyway. So uh, the rockets would have been available. And these would have been better. Unfortunately, the program was cancelled. So those are the ones I have here. I've got 30 at the bottom. I've got 8 in the second stage as as it would be. And then in the third stage I have had to make a replacement. Originally it was 4 NK21s but I don't have NK21s. So what I've done is I've replaced it with 1 NK43 which uh, I think would work. And of course they had the NK43 so that's not a problem. Um, I've also replaced the next stage instead of having four, uh, instead of having one NK19, which I don't have, I've put one RD0124, uh, and they would have had that as well. So that's not a, uh, that's not a replacement that would have been unrealistic. Oh yeah, I, I know what I want to say now. The version with the NK33s and 43s is actually technically called the N1F. That's what led me to look up here. Okay, the Soyuz. I don't know if I've got it right, um, and of course with the capsules I, d I had to do my best using these, so um, that's the only one I could get. This one had a weird attachment point issue. I would have liked to use it, but uh, I couldn't get it right. But yeah, I, I don't know how the actual assembly at the top is going to work. Let's just try and get this to orbit and see. I'm only going to put one Kerbal in. I actually haven't recovered. Uh, Jeb, Bill, and Bob from the Apollo mission. This is the same save, by the way. I'm gonna send Danwin Ker uh, Kerman up and just Danwin because uh, this is just a test run. If we do get to the moon, then actually uh, we, we could have him do the landing himself. Um, we'll see. We'll see how far we get. But we might do more... Uh, if we actually manage to get as far as the moon, I might have him do more of an Apollo 10 thing or Apollo 8 thing, just fly by. Uh, we'll see. Uh, let's let's get one thing done at a time and uh, already trying to get this into orbit is a uh, tricky enough business. Alright, so uh, see you on the launch pad. Okay, so here it is and now we're not in the right position for the moon I don't think. Um, let's see. Because we already did the Apollo mission and you can see I haven't retrieved the capsule yet. We're, we're quite a bit off from where Let's see. Doesn't look too bad though, honestly. Alright, well if, if we if we want to go for the moon, I guess we can go for the moon actually. But let's try and get this thing off the ground. It is much harder to get off the ground than uh, than the Saturn V was. This is Kerbal Joint Reinforcement uh, can do what it likes, but this is... And it is overpowered, so I'm going to actually launch at two-thirds power here. Alright, Danwin. Uh, we've got uh, lots of kerosene. This, uh, the stages mostly burn RP-1, which is kerosene, and then liquid oxygen. So that's what you see there. Alright. Uh, yep, here we go. I'm not going to do a countdown, let's just try and uh, stay safe, everybody, stay safe. So of course this is built with uh, the real engines, which 
allow me to cluster them like this. If you use real engines with the realism overhaul, you can the attachment points allow you to attach them any way you like, even without uh, turning on part clipping. Okay, uh, stretchy tanks, procedural fairings. Uh, there's a toroidal tank pack that allow me to put that dome one there, and there are a lot of other. Uh, uh, but ba basically this structure is procedural fairings and uh, stretchy tanks and real engines until you get to the very top in which case a lot of this stuff is from AIES aerospace pack okay I'm gonna be exceedingly gentle when it comes to the gravity turn I am not going to turn this the way I did with the Saturn V, which was already very gentle if you saw that video. And let me show you the main problem with the structure here. The Saturn V was about the diameter of this tank here. So this thing has a lot more aerodynamic pressure and the Saturn V, most of the aerodynamic pressure was on the top. Here, it's on every surface. It, I mean, it's basically on the entire vehicle. Now, that has some benefits, but a lot of drawbacks, especially when the vehicle has a 17 meter diameter as opposed to Saturn V's 10 meter diameter. So, and where it really comes to, I mean, the drag on the top isn't too bad. Uh, no, that's the inside stuff. Let's say here, 10 kilonewtons, fine. Uh, 20 kilonewtons, fine. Not a big deal. Where you get into trouble is here. Current drag, 1,500 kilonewtons and going up fast. And they could have avoided that if only they didn't have to fit 30 engines at the bottom. And they really didn't. If they could have uh, had reliable engines, they wouldn't have had to fit 30 of these down there. They could have fit 20 of them. As you can see, I'm throttled about half. So they could have fit 20 of them down there, and it would have been fine. And they could have built a smaller, a tighter stage, and they wouldn't have this humongous drag on it. I mean, think about how much power is being lost because we, we're developing such a huge drag. And it's only going up until we pass max Q. I'll just leave that on there, just just because it's such a fascinating thing. So obviously I'm going up much steeper than I did with the Saturn V, and I'm keeping much closer to the prograde vector here, because of the aerodynamic forces on the vehicle. I really should be deflecting, and I will. Let me deflect to uh, to uh, Mooner inclination. This first stage is killer. I mean, this is painful to uh, try and steer without the rocket breaking apart. Uh, the gimbling on the engines is not particularly great either. Of course, with 30 on them down there, you don't want them to gimbal too much. Uh, uh, I mean, just for the simulation, SAS would have a field day, right? I think we've already gone where no N1 has gone before. I don't think any of them lasted more than a minute. Okay, the drag is going down now, thankfully. So we've passed max Q. We are going much slower than the Saturn V would have been going at this stage. So let me throttle up and hope for the best. Obviously, I was throttled down because I was afraid of the stress on the vehicle. But we've passed max Q, so let's let's just go for it. We still got plenty of delta V in this stage.
which is actually sort of a worry because I don't really like the stage very much. I would like to get rid of the stage as quickly as possible. Once we get rid of the stage, it's much smoother sailing. And that's why uh, after I gained through the first stage, I felt that uh, the rest of it could probably get into orbit without any problems. And so I finished testing there and decided to record the video. So right now the Saturn V would be at 40 degrees. I'm at uh, more like 55-ish. I will be doing a realism overhaul series with the realistic progression light uh, tech tree. I decided with the response to the Saturn V series I, uh, I decided that I would do that. I've already recorded the first video of that. So, uh, so look forward to that as well. Um, my premise for that will be actually unlocking the Saturn V that I've already built. So I'll have that craft file in the folder and I'll be unlocking the parts and trying to get to the Saturn V. And then once I get to the Saturn V, I'll try and bring it to uh, well, I'll try to use it for a Mars mission, is frankly what I'll do. After all, the SLS they're building doesn't have that much more capability than the Saturn V had. But they think they can uh, use that for Mars missions, so I don't see why the original Saturn V couldn't have done it. Okay, I think I can go to full thrust now. Though the g-forces are a bit high. Let me back down for the sake of my Kerbal there. We're probably going to end up in a higher orbit than... Uh, well, we'll see. It depends how I pilot this thing. Not as much uh, aerodynamic effects going up, and that's because we were so steep. But I meant re-entry effects, of course. Re-entry effects, not, not much heating. Oh, I can take this at a better angle. Okay, uh, we're getting serious G-force. The, the, the wiggling is actually SAS and G-forces not mixing. And, uh, and especially the... Oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, let's just dump that stage. <laughs> that, that, that was not sounding good. All right. Yeah, that was sounding less than stellar right there. That sounded like uh, structural break part was imminent. So, and we were close enough to the end of it that, uh, like I said, I, I I wanted to get rid of that stage as quickly as possible anyway. This is still a phenomenally powerful stage. Uh, The equivalent stage on the Saturn V was not nearly as didn't nearly have as much thrust, and the result is that this rocket is not as efficient as the Saturn V. Uh, the payload it can deliver to uh, translunar injection is 23.5 tons. The Saturn V could deliver 45. Uh, so, so some of the over-engineering as far as putting rockets and uh, redundancy is concerned really hurt this. On, on the other hand, the, the good engineering on the Soyuz capsule itself means that even though it had to be much lighter, it actually was roomier than the Apollo command module. Though, 
Though the particular arrangement of that room might not be suited to everybody. But, uh, yeah. So there are pros and cons. Uh, but uh, Soyuz capsule, as far as capsules are concerned, uh, isn't too bad. So we're practically on the Primrose path here. Um, let's see... Yeah, I want to uh, get rid of this. Oh, I couldn't. Well, it went off anyway. Okay, let's see if our inclination is okay. Yeah, getting better and better. Uh, 7.2 now, 7.1. It's not quite in line with the... You can see there's sort of... If you get the moon's orbit flat, let's say like this, it's got a little bit of a lack of flatness, if you will. Uh, so it's a little bit off. We do have an overabundance of food, water, and oxygen, and that's partly because I think the Soyuz itself does have quite a lot. This was designed for uh, two people, not three people. One would stay in the command module and one would land on the moon. Uh, later developments, they, they eventually wanted to put two people in, but uh, initially they were only going to land one person on the moon. So all the burn times are all right. The vehicle mass, I don't think was quite right, though it was close. It was very close. Obviously I explained that on the later stages I have engine replacements. And those are, those are uh, approximate to the original and frankly probably uh, improvements. Okay, looks like we're gonna go clean on this one. It does have no problem getting to uh, getting to orbit. The, the Saturn V is a much more delicate balance, trying to trying to manage the time before apoapsis, but this one has plenty of time. Uh, actually, I still shouldn't tilt down. But yeah, this, this one has plenty of time to get to orbits. The Saturn V is a much more delicate thing. The, and that's because the engines are overpowered. I mean, it's just overpowered all the way. Um, it only delivers 90 tons to uh, low Earth orbit, which is less than the... I think it's 110 for the Saturn V. Something around there. Uh, the Saturn V is of course complicated because the third stage, part of it is used for the translunar injection. So it all depends how much uh, mass you end up with after burning it for the first time. Oh, uh, I should mention the... The... what you got? The Soviet engines, that uh, Bobcat Soviet engine pack. While it has a lot of things that are modeled for a realism overhaul, uh, one thing it doesn't have is engine igniter configurations. So I haven't had to worry about... Uh, of course, we've only been doing one ignition each time anyway. But I, have, I don't have to worry about ullage issues or anything like that, so I don't have ullage rockets on this. Though I'd probably do the spin method anyway. Um, so yeah, so you'll see that fuel flow, we don't have stable or unstable or anything like that. So that's not an issue, or and we don't have a list of how many ignitions we have. So, 
I would like uh, engine ignition configuration for the Soviet engines, though. If, uh, uh, I'll probably I, I, I might be able to uh, create it myself. I've taken a look at the engine ignition packs uh, configuration files anyway, so I'll have to uh, try that out. Uh, of course, with this N1, it was more of uh, I just wanted to try it out and uh, sort of spur of the moment kind of thing. I think at least one of the N1s was painted all white, uh, similar to what I have here. Uh, they, they, I think they all had weird different color schemes to them. Okay, we are getting a little bit decliny. Let's change that. Now, uh, one thing that I didn't have going for me was that, of course, I don't have an ascent profile for the N1. It never made it to orbit. So I don't know what works as far as an ascent is concerned. So remember with the Saturn V, I was uh, reading out uh, where it was when it hit uh, Mach 1, where it hit when it hit Max Q, uh, when it separated the first stage, etc. Of course, the N1 never got to separation of first stage, so I don't know exactly where to uh, do all the uh, to uh, tilt it. You know how long I should be uh, holding it up for. So I think I've probably flattened it out a little bit too early here. I'm gonna have to tilt up to correct that. So that's a miss on me. And uh, so if we have any trouble getting to the moon because of it, that's that's not the rocket's fault. But uh, I think we can get rid of far now. There is some struts. I I just thought that would be wise. Uh, this actually, because of uh, the struts and also the complexity with the 30 engines and all, uh, actually has double the part count of the Saturn V. The Saturn V uh, model that I made was uh, about uh, 130 parts. This is more like 240. I don't think I need to uh, save anything from this stage to get to the moon. I forget. I think the translunar stage was all in the... The L3 portion is the one up here. This is the L3. Okay, the N1 is the rest of it. The three stages that you've already seen. That's the launch system. So I think uh, I can burn this one out to get into orbit if I needed to. Wood anyway, of course. Uh, if uh, if I do have some fuel left over, I'll uh, use it to help my boost to the moon. I'm I'm gonna try and get as far as I can with whatever fuel I, as I can, and I'm not gonna dump any. Oh, uh, one difference between the Soyuz capsule and the uh, ones that you've probably commonly seen is that the Soyuz capsule uh, for the f regularly has two huge uh, distinctive solar panels and this one doesn't. The one that was meant for the moon had fuel cells instead, like the Apollo. I don't have the fuel cells, I think I just slapped RTGs. I, I've, uh, I built that first, so the spacecraft was built first, so I have spent a lot of time tweaking the rest of the rocket and I actually have forgotten exactly what I did with the top there. So uh, I'll have to see, once I open it up I'll go, oh, that's what I did. So, but I, I um, the tank life support system does have a fuel cell thing. I forget whether I put it on there though or not. Okay, well, we should be getting to orbit soon. Let's just focus prograde. I'm tilting up to make sure the apoapsis doesn't go up anymore.
So I'm gonna try and get as circular as possible. Okay, I think that's as good as I'm gonna get it. Alright, so we still have some fuel in this stage, and thankfully, uh, without Engine Igniter this time, we don't have to worry about that aspect of things. So we will reuse the stage. After all, I don't know exactly how they would have done it. Uh, they might have reused it anyway. Okay, when should we intercept the moon? Guess maybe burning out a periapsis would make sense. Uh, how far? Inclination is pretty bad. Let's see. Let's see what we can do with uh, intercepting the moon. It might be that we can still correct inclination. You can see where our ascending node is there. It's close enough to uh, to the planet that uh, we can... but far enough as well. So let's say we plot like this and bring it in as close as possible and then do a mid-course burn. It'd be horrible to um, do the burn right in at uh, Kerbin Periapsis or Earth Periapsis because that costs more but if we can do it out here that's better. Ah, uh, now we've got it, now we've got it. Okay. Ah, finicky stuff. Four forty seven? I think I can live with that. Anything else would probably be uh RCS burns or something like that. Uh Did I even put R oh yeah, I used nitrous oxide. The probably the closest uh, approximation to what they actually used. Do I have any reaction wheel power at all? Probably not. Oh well. Okay, I'm going to start the burn here in order to actually turn. Sorry, it's in the dark. There must be at least one engine that is configured. Oh, I've got Rockamax uh, 48-7S's on something. I wonder which one that is. Might be the lander. So again, this stage would originally have had four NK-21s. I've replaced it with one NK-43. So, uh, and the next stage would have originally had only one NK-19, and I've replaced it with four... Well, I forget if the RD-0124 uh, is a clustered one in the first place anyway. L let's see. Uh, why can't I stage? Um, interstage shroud. Well, that looks like what I wanted to get rid of. 
let's get rid of that. Okay, now. Strange, strange. Activate engine? Okay, well. Fine, fine, make me do everything. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's just one engine with four nozzles. Uh, and it's overheating. Whoa, whoa. Uh, it's still overheating. How am I supposed to stop this from overheating? Shut it off? What the heck is up with this engine? I guess it just doesn't like being placed on stretchy tanks? It's a good thing I can shut it off, but wow. I guess this must be... something happened with this engine that uh, is making an issue. Okay, well, uh, if I keep it down to this thrust, it'll be alright? Uh, uh, oh. Okay, let's just get rid of the overheat and keep it to... Ooh, now not even this is working. Wow, this is very, uh, very, very appropriate for the N1, I suppose. Now it's not overheating? I guess if I give it some time to cool down, it's alright. <laughs> uh, I don't know why it's overheating. Well, it looks like I'm gonna have to burn in bursts, folks. So I'll catch you on the other side of this nonsense. Actually, you know what? This might be a good time to use uh, MechJeb for something useful. Uh, MechJeb has a print prevent overheats thing that I never use, but uh, if there was ever a time for it, this seems to be it. Can it, uh, can it actually help this engine to survive? I'm, I have my hand on the throttle just in case. Uh, I don't think it was going to help. Ooh, that did not sound good at all. Okay, so MechJeb is not going to help me. Uh, yeah, let, let me go back to uh, doing it in bursts. See you at the other side. Well, this is strange. The, the system decided to get rid of my maneuver node for me. Because I was taking so long, I guess. Since when did that happen? Why did the maneuver node just disappear? This is now the next maneuver. Remember, I have a plane change maneuver to do as well. So, this is very inconvenient since I now don't... Well, I mean, I could just take a look at my apoapsis and wait till it gets to uh, moon or apoapsis, but this is... As if the engine overheating wasn't enough of a hassle, now I've got uh, my maneuver node has disappeared for some reason. I wonder if it's MechJeb or something. I shouldn't have let MechJeb try and prevent overheats. Letting MechJeb do anything is just a recipe for uh, for confusion. But yeah, I mean this thing seems to have really low heat tolerance. So you can take a look at it. Temperature going up, 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 up. When does it start to overheat? 1,200-ish? That's crazy. And this is no way near... I mean, I, I, I shouldn't even bother to uh, plot for... Uh, keep that plot for the moon because we're not going to be able to get this right anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually... I'll keep burning a little bit and then I'm going to come around and burn again. Yeah, so... Uh, so it continues. I'm going to be persistent about this. Uh, once again, see you on the other side, hopefully. Okay, so at this point I'm going to come around the planet and uh, start burning again at periapsis. Really, the node is all the way out here? Huh. thought it was closer to the planet, but it uh, looks like it's actually at a pretty high altitude. Well, anyway, if it gets us there, it gets us there. And we've got the Delta V. One thing this craft does not lack is Delta V. Hmm. 
what it does lack, of course, is uh, uh, heating stability in this particular stage. Oh dear. So I, I wasn't recording because I was doing that uh, perpetual burn thing. But uh, we just lost our, uh, our engine. <laughs> it exploded finally. It turns out that you don't have to go all the way to the top of overheating if you uh, come close enough. Often enough, I guess it just goes boom. Um, we had a lot of fuel left in this tank. Uh, in fact, uh, we would have had enough to uh, do the um, to the burn at the moon with this stage, which I don't think it was meant to do. I think it was meant to just get us there and then that's it. It wasn't meant to uh, do the orbital burn around the moon, uh, lunar orbit injection. Um, well, uh, there's nothing for it. Uh, we have to jettison the fairings around the L3 stage and use the L3 stage to get us there now. Okay. I don't know. These uh, this thing isn't decoupling very well these days. Okay. Well, that'll do. So I've used uh, orbital achievement device for the this stage because it was the one that was closest to the stats of what the rocket was supposed to be. I, I don't think I had anything. The original rocket had an ISP of 349 and a thrust of 83. This one has 75 thrust and better ISP. Anyway, so without further ado, uh, it does have ignition issues though, which is going to be fun. Uh, let's face it, because uh, so this one does have engine igniter. So we do have to make sure that our fuel flow is stable and everything, all that. But anyway, uh, let's let's hope for the best. Uh, but uh, notice, uh, twenty-three. Uh, the advertised amount was twenty-three point five tons to the moon, and if we did expend that stage normally, that's that's how much we would have had. Uh, so this is a uh, correctly sized craft, uh, exactly as advertised. And this, this rocket was meant to do the circular, circularization burn. And I believe also, yeah, yeah, it was also supposed to do the landing burn for the lander. So we would, once we got into orbit around the moon, and we might still do that, uh, it would decouple the Soyuz portion and then uh, bring the lander down. So it would bring the lander down. Uh, not all the way, of course. It would decouple before the lander actually made its landing. The... Lo the oh, sorry. Dan would have to talk. Anyway, um, so then the lander would uh, basically do the final descent burn. As far as I understand it, this is... Uh, this is mainly what I understand from the situation and obviously they never did it so I can't be a hundred percent sure but uh, it would be uh, decouple the tank and then uh, do the final descent with the lander and then the same engine that the lander uses for the descent it will uh, use for the ascent as well but it would dump behind its lander legs and some of the stage that was uh, no longer necessary for the ascent so not quite the same lander profile as the Apollo mission. Now that the the cosmonaut would have had to uh, EVA to the lander, uh, they did not. Uh, they did not have the more interesting situation of a tunnel between them. Uh, it, it it's still coupled with the Soyuz, obviously. It did couple with the command module, but there was no tunnel to go through between the two. So there was a docking, but there was no way to go through the two vehicles. Okay. We're still boosting away.
it is a shame that it's in the dark, otherwise I'd be able to talk about the components and of course check out what I actually did up here because it's been a while since I actually looked at this part because I was fine-tuning the launcher. So I, I would like to take a look at it too. So yeah, it turns out the RD... The RD-0124 uh, was not a good idea for that stage, and I don't know what was up with that. Of course, it shouldn't be overheating like that. I don't understand what was happening. We've got 200 uh, possible ignitions here, but... Oh, I, I guess we would still... I don't see any uh, need for hypergolic fuel or anything like that, so I guess it will be fine. Okay, we're getting close to the moon. And we can't relight. Ha ha ha. Okay, um, so... Can we use RCS to do this? Or... Why can't we relight? Oh, no, we can relight. Okay. It was just taking a little bit of time. Yeah, it seems like we're coming in a little bit weird here. Let me just point prograde. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, we're actually making things worse. Alright. Let's say we do another burn here to correct all this. Coming in too low. Okay, that looks good. So we'll do this one final burn in order to uh, get us there. Let's quickly check fuel stability. Looks like it's very stable. That's good. Ah, now we can see it. There we are. It is the closest approximation I could get to the Soyuz and its lander. And you can see much spamming of these uh, AIES modules. Okay, we're doing that thing again. Good thing we have 200 relights on this particular engine. Hmm. Huh. Well, that's not a great resulting trajectory, but... Uh, can't be too picky at this point. Alright, I think we're on a decent trajectory for the moon. We could probably do a few other corrections on the way. But, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to call it an episode at this point. So uh, tune in for the second part of this special where we'll see how far Danwin Kerman gets. Already, uh, this has exceeded all expectations, obviously. I didn't expect it to... Uh, go this far. At least I hadn't, uh, well, I mean, I hadn't even brought it to orbit before, so what can we do? Uh, you can see a lot of fiddly bits. Oh, I do I do have this fuel cell. Yeah, there's these, this alkaline cell that uh, we can use uh, to recharge if necessary, so that's good. Alright, so there you have it. Uh, we'll try our best to uh, get Danwin as far as we can get him once we uh, once we get to the moon yep so we are going to the moon with the N1 L3 and uh, 
that that's all I have to say about that. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments, suggestions, leave them in the comment section below. After all, this uh, this whole N1 trip uh, was uh, brought on by a comment on the Saturn V video. So if you do have a comment, uh, I will take it into consideration. And see you next time.